joining us today as we talk about our latest Phonolytics original study titled Joining Forces, Collaborative Opportunities Between the Animal Protection and Environmental Movements. My name is Connie Arevalo. I am a research scientist at Phonolytics and also the lead researcher of this study. And today I'm joined by David Rooney, who led a similar research with Mercy for Animals. So David, would you like to introduce yourself and briefly tell us what your study was about? Hey y'all, I'm David Rooney. Uh, I'm a doctoral student at the University of Texas at Austin, where I'm pursuing a PhD in communication studies and particularly about how we talk about animals and how we talk about food. And the research I was involved with was called Willing But Uncertain. And it measured how environmental organizations across the United States, 70 of them, perceive messaging on animal efficacy. What are their hesitations? What would they be open to? Things like that. Awesome. Thanks, David. So today, David and I are going to be talking about what our combined findings can tell us about the potential for collaboration between environmentalists and animal advocates. Um, so we know that there's a lot of overlap between the animal protection movement and the environmental movement, especially when we take into consideration the impact that the animal agriculture industry has on animals, the environment, the climate. Um, so for this phonolytic study, we started by identifying countries that had the most need for environmental action and for animal advocacy. And we found that there's actually a very strong relationship between countries' greenhouse gas emissions and their potential for effective farmed animal advocacy. So for this reason, we chose to focus our study on the US, China, and Brazil. And we interviewed eight environmental organizations that work in these countries, mainly to get their perspectives about what the potential challenges and benefits of collaborating with animal advocates may be, and really to understand if there's even interest in collaborating in the first place. So what we found was that there is indeed potential for collaboration between our two movements. Half of the organizations that we interviewed said that they would be open to the idea of collaborating with animal advocates. And the other half already had some experience collaborating with animal advocacy organizations. And they seemed pretty excited about the possibility of continuing these collaborations in the future and of starting new partnerships. So in terms of what these collaborations can look like, um, there are lots and lots of possibilities. So our interviews with just these eight organizations gave us over a dozen different collaboration possibilities, uh, different potential um, collaboration strategies. Um, so the ones that came up the most had to do with legal advocacy, education, and promoting dietary shifts. In terms of legal advocacy, this can be like taking legal action against industries that are harmful to the environment and to animals, like factory farms. Um, it can also mean taking, uh, sorry, working on developing new policies and regulations to protect the environment and animals or trying to improve current ones. Um, there was also interest in education, as I mentioned. So this can mean um, helping people transition to more sustainable or animal friendly um, diets by educating them about the connections between diets and climate change. Um, it can also mean working in schools together um, to teach students about animal advocacy issues and environmental issues. Um, and then in terms of dietary shifts, it's just what it sounds like. Again, helping people transition to more animal friendly diets, more sustainable diets, um, but also maybe working with institutions, with the government, hospitals, um, schools um, to offer more plant based options on menus. Um, so those are the main ones that came up, but some other potential collaboration strategies uh, that were mentioned in the interviews had to do with organizing demonstrations together. So like marches, strikes, protests, things like that, um, working together on divestment campaigns to divest and defund the industrial animal agriculture industry. Uh, you can also work on corporate campaigns together to get company commitments for more environmentally friendly and animal friendly practices. Um, you could also collaborate on research at the intersection of the environment and animal advocacy. And again, there are many more examples that you can find in the report if you check them out. So I do recommend you take a look whenever you get a chance. Um, now, as for the benefits of collaborating, we know that there are many benefits. That's why we're interested in this research in the first place. Um, but 
Some of the most talked about benefits in the interviews had to do with sharing resources with their partner organizations, um, sharing experience working with particular audiences or um, implementing certain strategies, knowledge about specific topics, um, and also finding new funding opportunities at the intersection of the environment and animal advocacy. Um, there are yeah, oh, sorry. Good Our uh, study found looked at a very similar. Um, asked directly these seventy environmental organizations what they were missing that would stop them from messaging on animal agriculture, and overwhelmingly, we asked them, for example, would they not do it for fear of backlash, which is a common perception, or a fear that it wouldn't pass in terms of legislation. Politicians are unfriendly, but the number one um, hesitation was just that they were unfamiliar with messaging on animal advocacy. Um, but they were very willing to. They just had never done so before. So when we asked um, in a follow-up question, what specific steps would they be looking for, the environmental organizations that were willing to message on animal issues, which again was most of them, were seeking specifically communication campaigns to reach the public and then their local audiences. So in particular, what they sought was ready-to-go communication campaigns that would be accessible to their audience's everyday life. And examples of this was that um, organizations had suggested if we could pass along messaging campaigns or infographics that say, each burger consumes waste this amount in water in this area, or that CAFOs in North Carolina pollute this many amounts of neighborhoods that could really concretize what they're trying to reach out. But they just don't have that data. They don't have that experience. Um, and the same is also true, as you mentioned, Connie, for dietary shifts, where these organizations were very open to messaging on even going vegan or reducing meat um, a, a, a solid amount. Um, it was ranked as highly as shifting from beef to chicken, which is one of the most popular um, maybe tensions between environmental movements to um, and animal advocates on shifting from beef to chicken, which would reduce some amount of water, but obviously increase harms to chicken. So um, broadly, environmental organizations, uh, like I mentioned, were just unfamiliar with what to do properly, and they really wanted uniform campaigns. They wanted other environmental organizations to have the same message as them, and they didn't want to be the first mover. They didn't want to be um, stand out by themselves and risk, you know, maybe some negative perceptions. Absolutely. Well, that's so interesting. So there's definitely potential there to share knowledge and resources um, and expertise. So yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, now, if we look at the flip side of this, not so much of the benefits, but if we're now talking about some challenges that might come up when collaborating, um, the main one that came up in our interviews had to do with this idea of there being differing views between organizations or between the movements. So this can mean that there are differences in opinions or in the views about particular topics, like regenerative agriculture came up a few times, um, or just in the strategy strategies that organizations want to implement, like one organization might be used to doing things one way, the other organization normally does things a different way. And so it's a matter of finding that balance or deciding which of these two strategies do we want to go with. Um, and similarly, um, in terms of messaging, that can also be an issue sometimes um, where environmentalists may want to implement environmental messaging, of course, animal advocates will want to focus more on that animal side. Um, and so some compromise may be necessary there or trying to decide, all right, which of these two messaging frameworks can we go with or can we combine them in some way in something like One Health where we can tie health and animal advocacy and the environment um, into one. Um, so just uh, some things that might come up but that should be talked about early on in any kind of collaboration that might happen. And one thing that we found is that as you mentioned with One Health is a great example, not all forms of collaboration are the same. So we found that most organizations like you did already message on animal advocacy, but it's it's rarely a top issue. And only 50% 50% uh, said that was only in the top 10. And then only I think 10% said it was in their top four or five issues. So not all forms of collaboration necessarily, as you mentioned, prioritize animal advocacy, even if they're open to it right now. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, that's so interesting. Um, and I will mention another 
challenge that came, potential challenge that came up a few times has to do with uh, society's perception of animal advocates. So there's this perception that the public generally views animal advocates maybe negatively. Um, so there might be fear from some environmental organizations about collaborating with animal advocates if they think that it might taint their reputation in some way or that it might alienate their audience. Um, but David, you found something pretty similar in your research, right? Mm -hmm. Is so this was a, a big perception that we asked um, these 70 organizations about um, because like you said, it is a popular belief, but we found that for, for whatever reason, only 16% of them actually suggested that they were afraid of backlash and that's why they might not prioritize it as much. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the number one reason that they don't prioritize it is a lack of familiarity and then in terms of how they feel their audience is, um, they're not actually that afraid of backlash. What they're afraid of is that the public is indifferent. So the number one motivator for these environmental organizations, even beyond increased funding or friendly politicians, um, was some way to tell that the public cared deeply about animal advocacy. Um, so for I, I think it is a common um, assumption that there will be a lot, a lot of backlash, but that's not, not necessarily held up as much as people might assume in our report. And um, another project I recently completed with Mercy for Animals on dietary shifts um, in the West Coast, which was recently passed into law in February in LA County, we found similarly very broad public support for legislation that would encourage a shift to plant-based diets. So it seems that both the organizations and the public are more open to this and less likely to backlash than we may assume, but the data is just not there for these organizations to feel very comfortable yet. Yeah, and just to add to what you were saying, um, we do have some previous phonolytics research that has found that environmental sympathizers are um, pretty likely to uh, take pro-animal actions like going vegan or vegetarian or supporting, supporting um, pro-animal legislation. And um, just animal advocacy in general can be a really good motivator as well for people to switch to more sustainable or animal friendly diets and not just to switch, but to actually maintain that long term. So, yeah, if these concerns do come up, I think it is important for animal advocates to, you know, let environmental organizations know that research does exist on this and that their audiences might actually be pretty open to animal advocacy messaging. Um, so I'm just going to briefly mention two other potential challenges that may come up before we move on to some recommendations for advocates. Um, but sort of along what we were just talking about, um, there's this perception that animal advocates aren't really concerned about human issues, so like social justice issues, and that animal advocates are sometimes involved in pushing white veganism. So, for example, North American advocates advocating for veganism and the global south without really considering the history or the culture of the areas where they're pushing this. Um, so I do think that that is something that we should be keeping in mind and collaborating with local organizations can be a good idea if you think that this might be a concern. Um, and one other challenge I will mention is that there was some concern about the animal agriculture industry's power in politics, which can make it hard to pass legislation in any of these three countries, in the U.S., China, and Brazil, um, especially if you're targeting the meat industry. So, again, something to keep in mind. And in the case of China in particular, there can be also some fear of retaliation from the government itself for collaborating with animal advocates. So, yeah, these are definitely some more serious concerns that should be kept in mind um, and discussed early on in any kind of potential collaboration if we think that these challenges might come up later and affect how um, effective the collaboration can be. Our study also found the, a, a significant concern about white veganism or cultural norms, but almost paradoxically, we asked respondents what audiences could they message on animal issues to? And overwhelmingly, they chose predominantly non-male, non-white, and younger audiences as being more comfortable to message on wow. um, plant-based diets. So at the same time that there's a fear of cultural normativity or imposing particular Western standards, um, these organizations are more open to non-white and non-male and younger audiences when they talk about plant-based diets than others. So may exist a little bit um, potentially in, in tension there, but it's interesting finding. Yeah, that's so interesting. 
Um, so taking into consideration everything that we've talked about, um, let's just jump into some recommendations. So I think the first thing that I have to highlight is that you know, if there are animal advocates that are interested in collaborating with a particular organization, just reach out. It really can't hurt to see if the organization that you're interested in working with is maybe interested in working with you too. Now, I can't guarantee that every single organization will want to collaborate, but our findings do show that there are definitely environmental organizations out there who are open to the idea of collaborating with animal advocates. Um, but I will highlight here that you should take the time to explain how your advocacy work relates to that environmental organization's work. Um, not all environmental organizations will have a good understanding of animal advocacy or about the connections that exist between our two movements. So really do take the time to explain how this collaboration is relevant to them, how the work that you're doing is relevant, the issues that you're working on, how they all tie together. Um, David, I think you have some really cool uh, recommendations too, if you wanted to jump mm -hmm. in there. Yeah, so we sort of um, prefaced this earlier. I'll pick three big things from our study that very much align with what you're just saying. The first is, like we mentioned earlier, is that animal advocates have a lot to offer these environmental organizations. The, again, the big barrier to communicating on this is that they're just not familiar. They don't have the materials, infographics, videos, um, data to communicate to their particular pub public. So. These organizations that we surveyed, they were asking enviro, enviro, animal advocates to reach out to them with these campaigns and materials that could allow them to reach their audience. Um, and the second sort of takeaway or recommendation is that animal advocates, um, a key weapon, or maybe not a key weapon, a key motivator <laughs> that we could bring to environmental organizations is evidence that the public does care about this issue. Um, and that, again, this was one of the, the key motivators for environmental organizations is could we show public support? And particularly for that region or that area, if you could showcase, showcase that the public has a particular mindset towards whatever given reforms or changes you're proposing, they are much more likely to um, to message on animal advocacy. The final uh, recommendation I think for animal advocates is to not look at what an organization is doing, an environmental organization, and conclude that that's what it can do in the future. So we actually message a variety of staff across the organization, and over 91% of the staff found that it was, or rated it very important to message on animal advocacy in regards to their environmental goals, even if their organization wasn't prioritizing the issue. So even if you know organizational behavior doesn't reflect the entirety of what is possible in an organization, the staff there may be a lot more open and willing than their organization might indicate. Oh, yeah, thank you. And that might also be a great opportunity, like if some people in the organization might be open to this, but if you need to convince the higher ups, it might be a, a good opportunity to mention that you know, this research exists showing that their audiences may be particularly receptive to animal advocacy messaging. So check out that Phonolytics research. Um, so if you do foresee any potential challenges, um, I do think it is very important that these challenges are talked about early on um, so that organizations can come up with a game plan together to address them if and when they come up later. And also just keep in mind that compromise might be necessary from both involved organizations. So like if you're struggling to reach agreement about what messaging framework you want to use, then I don't know, maybe you see if it's a possibility to combine them or you might have to have some discussions to decide on which of the two possibilities here makes the most sense. But some compromise sometimes may be necessary. Now, if even after discussing potential challenges, there is still concern about things like backlash or retaliation from your audience or even from the government, then keep in mind that quiet collaboration is also an option. And what I mean by quiet collaboration is that you can share resources with each other. You can share your expertise about using a particular tactic or about working with a particular audience or about a certain topic um, without ever having to go fully public about working together. Um, this is more of a behind the scenes supporting each other kind of thing. So just keep in mind that that is also an option. And one last thing I'm going to touch on, um, I didn't really get to discuss this too much, but I do think it's important to mention that 
the environmental and the animal advocacy issues of Brazil, China, and the U.S. are very much connected. So collaborations that can tackle these issues in some or in all three of these countries simultaneously are especially important. So, for example, you can, you can consider tackling uh, factory farming in Brazil, which is causing deforestation of the Amazon rainforest for meat that will be exported to the U.S. and to China. So we definitely see those connections happening, and I do recommend you check the report to see some more of those um, connections. Um, but just keep in mind that if you can collaborate in all three countries, even better. Um, but if you are planning to work in the global south or with historically disadvantaged communities, definitely try to collaborate with local organizations so that you can come up with um, the best way to tackle the issue together while keeping in mind these important historical and cultural contexts. Um, so with that said, uh, David, is there anything else you'd like to add before we move on to any questions from the audience? No, I think that was great. I'm ready for some questions. Awesome. Let's see if we have anything here. Alrighty, we have one question. It says, hi, I'm an environmental consultant from India. This is really interesting and I look forward to reading the report. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, where did India feature in your country selection in terms of matching environmental and animal welfare issues for the study? Awesome question and very relevant. Um, India was definitely at the top of the countries that we were considering. Um, it definitely does have a great need for environmental action, for animal advocacy. Um, at the end of the day, we just, you know, uh, we can only focus on so many countries at once. So we went with the top three countries for um, potential for effective farmed animal advocacy and China and the U.S. were at the top for both animal advocacy and for environmental uh, need. So those two we were definitely going to consider. Um, and then Brazil um, being in third place in terms of effective uh, potential for effective farmed animal advocacy was the other one that we decided to focus on. But India was definitely one of the ones that I wish we'd had um, the ability to also focus on because I do think it would be really interesting to look at and I'm hoping that maybe in the future we can or someone else can um, look at the potential for collaboration between these two movements in India because I do think it would be very valuable but that's kind of the rationale behind um, that the, the country selection. As I mentioned earlier, our study focused just on the United States, although I, I think it would have been fascinating as well to, to hear that overlap or potential in India. But unfortunately, uh, we were a bit more narrow than even Connie's study of analytics. Yeah. Let's see. Just checking if we have more questions. Um, all right, we got another one here. Hi, this is Subi. I love how you combine animal and environmental studies with this study. How do you think decolonial studies and practices affect your study? Like how could you how how could your report be useful for decolonial movements in the global south or even in the imperial core? Ooh, that Subi is with it. a hard hitting question. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Um let me give me one second to process this. Well, I do think the one thing Connie mentioned earlier is when you connect animal issues to environmental issues to issues of a global scope, and in particular deforestation in Brazil, um, traditionally in the United States, land for livestock was uh, stolen from indigenous land and even still continues to this day. We do see a rise in meat consumption from different parts of the world, particularly China, but also some parts of the global south. But there is a, a movement as well in the Global South for people to combine um, animal advocacy and environmental care. So there's a, one Instagram user in particular who has a following um, called African Vegan on a Budget, I believe it is, mm -hmm. who talks about her advocacy for veganism as a return to um, traditional forms of diet that deprioritized meat. Um, and I believe she was from Zimbabwe. So those movements do um, exist. Of course, the United States is still sort of a, a major player just because we have a lot of environmental organizations that have international reach. Um, but I, I think certainly there's things from, from both studies to be taken and, and learned from for this. Yeah, absolutely. And just to 
Let's bring up some examples that came from the interviews. Um, this is some, a concern that came particularly from uh, organizations that are doing more work in the global south. Um, so mainly from Brazil, a little bit of concern again from organizations working in China. Um, but yeah, this idea of like the white North American vegan coming into um, areas that historically haven't um, always consumed too much meat. Granted, it is rising now, um, but you know, concerns about really pushing veganism in these areas. And I do think it's important that in these instances, if there are these kinds of concerns, um, we don't necessarily have to be focusing so much on um, trying to shift diets there. And if these concerns exist, we can take that focus of trying to tackle factory farming more, of trying to tackle the industries that are harming um, the environment there and these communities, because there are lots of social justice issues involved here as well. Um, so, yeah, if these concerns do come up, I think it's important to consider, all right, maybe we can approach this a little bit differently and try to tackle the the industry that is harming, you know, um, both our movements that is relevant to both our movements. Um, all right, let's see if we have another question. All right, we've got another one here. Um, what do you recommend animal advocates do if they're having a hard time reaching environmental organizations about collaborating? I could start, um, yeah, if that's okay. It. So uh, I, I could start, I think, because I had to reach out to quite a lot of environmental organizations to take my survey. So I mentioned we surveyed 70 in the end. That was just the good data that we ended up using. But I reached out to about 650 environmental organizations across the United States. Um, and we had a goal to hit a certain amount on the state level per each state and then a certain amount for the, the national level. So even for local organizations, we contacted quite a few. And I would say um, even if you just look at our study about how staff feel compared to what organizations behave, it's as simple as reaching out to those organizations and asking them about potential for collaborations. Um, I would have never assumed that these people uh, or these organizations were open to collaborations, but I sent them a survey and I can't tell you how many organizations, particularly local ones, contacted me and said, please share the report when you're done. I want to hear how we can use this in Louisiana or, or wherever it happens to be. So I think it's hard sometimes because it's it's difficult to make these pathways, but as animal advocates, we can reach out and contact them. And I think they're a lot more willing than we might assume. Awesome. Yeah. And similar experience. Um, yeah, it can be hard to get um, responses sometimes. Um, I think we got responses from about a third of the organizations that we contacted to get interviews from. Um, so, yeah, it can be tough. Um, but I do think that it is important here to consider that, you know, our interview findings did show that not all environmental organizations are going to have a good understanding of animal advocacy. So definitely take the time to explain, first off, what animal advocacy is, if they're maybe not um, too sure of what it is that we do. Um, explain what your organization does and how it is relevant to the work that they do, to the goals that they have. Um, you know, try to set up a call just to discuss how the collaboration might benefit them. You know, people definitely want to hear like, all right, what what do I have to win from this? Um, so set up a call if you can discuss how this is all relevant um, to each other. And if there are any concerns about collaborating, um, you know, take the time to address these concerns um, early on and try to figure out a game plan for handling them later on if, if they do become more of an issue. And the last thing that I did find was very helpful for us um, was introductory emails. So if you have any kind of contacts that have a contact at the organization that you are thinking of collaborating with, see if they can send an email to just introduce you because having you know, that, that connection um, in between can really, really help. Um, and that's how we were able to get um, a few of the interviews that we might have been struggling getting beforehand. So if you if that is a possibility, I recommend that you try to approach it that way as well. Alrighty. So it looks like those are all the questions that we have for today. 
Um, if you do think of a question later, just please reach out to us either by sending an email to info at phonolytics.org. You can also visit my office hours on Tuesdays, um, or you can send us a direct message right here. So thank you all so much for joining us. And thank you, David, for taking the time to chat with me and us today. Hope you thank have you so a much. great rest of your day. Yeah, thanks. You too.